take off. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I say hi to them first because after that, I'm always talking to everybody else in there. So, anyway, we are here in Bloomington, and uh, this afternoon we have um, we have a few visitors uh, from China. So, for you guys in China, we have two more friends here. <laughs> There's Mia and Alicia. That's not their Chinese names, but um, that's that's what they call themselves. So it's uh, Zhang Yihan and Chen Su. Yeah? yeah, yeah, that's their Chinese names. It's not that I can't say it, but they want to be called the English names, so we, we're doing that. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> so this afternoon we're going to be um, talking a little bit about a passage. If you want to look in Matthew chapter six. We're going to start in verse 25. You all set? Got it? There's a verse that's the song that we sing. Okay. So, Matthew 6. Now, this is a topic that um, everybody can relate to. Okay? Everybody can relate to. And this is a a lesson that Jesus taught about do not worry. (laughs) How many, is there anybody here that has never worried? None of us. We have all worried sometimes, don't we? Yeah. It's it's a very common human emotion that sometimes we worry because and and what are some of the reasons that we worry? You think? I mean, usually when I think of worrying, I think I think of well, you know, uh, I worry because I I want things to be a certain way, and if I don't think it's going to be that way, or I'm concerned that it won't be that way, then I get anxious about it. I, 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 I want things to happen a certain way in a certain time, etc. And, and so I start thinking about it, even though I know that there's very little I can do about it, but that's what makes me worry about it. The fact that I can't do anything about it. So what I do is I don't, I, I get, uh, all nervous because I can't control something. And that's always a tough thing when I'm trying to control something that I cannot control. In in Matthew chapter 6, starting in 20, verse 25, he says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food, and the body more important than clothes? Look at the birds of the ear. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they are? Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? We can't even add a single minute. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow? They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, in all his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow, is thrown into the fire, will he not do much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. So, 
<laughs> the first thing I'd like to talk about is just the fact that God does not want us to worry about our physical needs. Jesus said that he knows what we need and that life is more important than just physical needs. That when we think of life, you know, what are the most important things of life? Like Alicia and I were talking about that yesterday. We're talking about what's really important. A lot of times people think that the most important things are just physical things. You know, they think it's, 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 you know, about how they look or they think about their clothes or their job or their money or their this or their that. But none of that means anything if you don't have what's really important. And that's the love that's in your heart. The Bible says that God is love and that we were created by God in his likeness, which means that at our very core of our being, we were created to be people of love, to love in our hearts. And we never feel satisfied. We never feel content unless we feel that love. So we need to have people that we love, that we give love to, whether that be loving God and worshiping God, loving our family. Maybe our mom, our dad, our brothers, our sisters, loving our friends. Or if we have a boyfriend or a girlfriend or we're married, our spouse, our husband, our wife, our children. You know, there's many different kinds of relationships. But the thing that makes all of them important, the thing that makes all of them worth having is love. If you don't have love, you really don't have anything. So Jesus here is saying, look. Our needs are going to be met through God's blessings and by us just living the way life was intended to be lived. That when we live our life the way we were created to live it, we're not going to be worried. We're going to be okay. And he says, look, who of you by worrying can add even a single hour to his life? The fact is that what we worry about is always outside of our control anyway. There's nothing, the whole reason we worry is because we can't do anything about it. If we could do something about it, we'd just do it, wouldn't we? The reason we worry is because we can't do anything about it. We worry about time. We worry about, you know, where where am I going to get this? Where am I going to get that? What's going to happen tomorrow? You know, will this person like me? Will this person not like me? Will they, you know, we have all these thoughts in our head. But they're always things that we can't do anything about. The second point is that God knows our needs. Look, we are his creation. He says the, he says, uh, the things like clothes and, and, and flowers and jobs and money, all of these things, are these things good things? Yeah, they're all good things, aren't they? But they're things that are blessings. They're the blessings of life. But they're not life. There's a difference between the blessings of life and life. Life is more important than blessings. But blessings are what make life sweet. And and the Bible says, Jesus says, look, your father knows that you need these things. He knows what you need. You were created by him. He's going to make sure that you have these things. And really, when you think about it, if you think about even the great majority of people, even if they're really poor, they they generally find some way to have the basic things, whether it be clothes on their back or relationships or, or, or food to eat or water to drink. Now, there are some people that struggle even to have that, you know, if they're poor in the middle of a drought or something. But in most cases, the great majority of cases, people are able to do these things. He knows what we need a lot of times before we even know that we need it. And he knows things that we don't, that we don't need and that we don't even know we need. The fact is, we are his children. And he loves his children with a much deeper love than for things. (laughs) Think about it. I know that in this room right now, two of us have children. Four of us don't have children. 
at least to my knowledge. I assume that every, the single people here do not have children. But every one of you, I'm sure, if you had children, you would love them very much. We love our children. We would do anything for them. You know, I, we, Julie and I have grandchildren. Uh, Alicia met them. Mac and Ben have met them. You haven't met them yet. But they are so precious. You know, I mean, they're beautiful. They're innocent. They're sweet. You know, they're, 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 they're filled with life and love. And, and if you look at them, they're so innocent. The last thing they're worried about, they're not worried about food. <laughs> they're not worried about what they wear. They don't worry about anything. You, you take Jonathan and give him a bath, let him go. He'd run all over the neighborhood naked. He wouldn't care. He wouldn't worry anything about clothes. You know, he is completely innocent. He doesn't know anything about anything. But you know what he knows? I'll tell you what he really, really wants. When he's hungry, he wants to be fed, and he always wants to be loved. He always wants to be loved. He wants to be held. He wants to be hugged. He wants to be taken care of. He wants to, he wants to be loved. And as he gets older, he wants to give love. Even James is only three. You'll want, if you watch him with Jonathan, <laughs> he wants to share love. He wants to put his arms around mom and dad and hug him. Like when he leaves, he'll come and he'll hug you real tight. Like he wants, if Jonathan comes, he'll go and he'll be very gentle with Jonathan. Or if Jonathan is trying to walk somewhere he shouldn't go, James will say, Jonathan, come here, come here, and he'll go get him. You know, well, why does he do that? It isn't like an adult made him do that. It's because he has a love in his heart for his little brother. So even at a very, very young age, there's that desire for love and that connection. And you can see it even in the youngest of children. Jesus said that when you talk about the physical things of the world, he says, pagans run after all these things. Now, usually when in, in, in the Bible, when they talk about a pagan, what they're talking about, when they talk about as a pagan, are people that have no concern about what is godly or, or right and wrong or anything else. All they care about is themselves. All they care about is their physical needs and their physical desires. And, and when you live a life where your whole world is all about obtaining physical things, it's a very empty world. Because you're always dissatisfied. You're never happy. Because whatever you get, as soon as you get it, you want something else. You're constantly wanting something else. So people that live just for entertainment, just for pleasure, just for whatever, are never satisfied. They never feel, they're never at peace in their heart. They never feel good about things. Our lives can be filled with worry and desires for the worldly things, and we can fill our time and efforts with getting stuff. And it's really easy to get sucked into that. Okay? I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're the most religious person in the world or if you're a person who's not religious at all. Everybody, at one point or another, is going to chase after some physical stupid thing. Okay, so like some people think, oh, that person is, you know, very religious. That person is very close to God or they're a devout Christian or they're a devout Buddhist or they're whatever. They think, oh, they don't care about those things. That's not true. They do. Everybody does because it's part of being a human being. And being a human being doesn't mean that we stop having any of the desires or, or concerns that any human being does. It's just that by being close to God, we try to monitor that and regulate it and try to be, to do the right thing. And like we were talking, we talked about, well, what happens? Well, if you learn the right thing and you learn what, what's right, what's, how is this supposed to be? How is my life supposed to be lived? And I learn what that is and I understand it and I put my faith or my trust in God or Christ, and then I take those things and I put them into practice. Well, many things happen then. When I take something and I do it the right way and I put it into practice, number one, it becomes more and more clear to me. I understand it better and better. 
Number two, I learned to discern what's right and what's not right. So, for instance, a few minutes ago, Nia was playing piano. And, or I was talking about Julie playing piano. And I said, well, sometimes Julie makes mistakes. Max said, how can you tell? Well, to be honest, if somebody is playing who's really excellent piano player, and they're playing a very elaborate piece, and they make a small mistake, I cannot tell. Why? Because I don't practice all the time these things. I can't tell subtle things. Now, I can tell something real obvious. You know, like if someone just really messes it up, or they just stop in the middle of the piece because they don't know where to go next. Well, that's obvious. I can figure that one out. But if it's something subtle, I cannot. I cannot. But take somebody who practices all the time, they can. They know right away. They, they listen and go, oh, there, there it is. They, oh, there's another one. Oh, they hit the wrong note. Why do they know that? Because they practice it again and again and again. And so they become excellent at what they practice. And so if you want to be excellent when it comes to righteousness and being right and doing the right thing for the right reason, you have to put it into practice and practice it all the time. And the more you practice it, the more obvious it will be to you. You will be able to tell what's right and what's not. And you'll be able to, it'll, it'll click with you in a way that maybe somebody else won't. So when you're in the habit of doing it the right way, you might see something and say, that's not right. And somebody else to you that doesn't practice it will look at you and say, what's wrong with that? I didn't see anything wrong. And you go, uh-uh. No, 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 no. That was not right. That person is not telling the truth. Or that person is not dependable. I know that. And how do they know? Because. Because they practice it. They know. So, God, the last point is that God wants our thoughts and our hearts to be filled with his kingdom and his righteousness. Okay? Well, what do we talk about when he says his his righteousness or his kingdom? Well, <laughs> God has a kingdom, but it's not a kingdom like a worldly king. It's not like the United States kingdom or Roman, you know, the Roman days kingdom or the Chinese emperor's kingdom or, you know, kingdoms of the world. It's not that kind of kingdom. It's a kingdom of the heart. It's a spiritual thing. So the, the, Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. It's within your heart. It's a spiritual kingdom. Now, it's still very real, but it's a spiritual kingdom. And it's not the physical things are going to pass away, which we know. We see all the time, right? Every day we see physical things pass away. And we know that every physical thing that we ever see on this earth is a point where it began, where it wasn't there before, and there's a point it ends. And that's true of everything that's physical, not with God. So he's saying to us to put our hope and our love and our service to him. And that when we do this, we build a spiritual kingdom, one that has no end to it. One that doesn't have a beginning and an end. Because the things of the heart, the things of the spirit, the spiritual side of things, the things of love and godliness and spiritual, those never end. They were always there. They're never going to end. They carry on forever. So he's saying, put your efforts there. He said, think about my kingdom and my righteousness. Think about what I'm telling you, how life should be lived. Think about that. Think about loving and serving other people. Think about sharing my love with people. Think about those things, and then what will happen, he says. Then everything else will be added to you. So when you get it right, when we get it right, when we do it the way it should be done, and we get our priorities right, and we, we, we love God, and we love what's right and the way life should be lived, and we live our life the way we should, and we do this and we practice it, we learn to discern, we learn to become mature spiritually, okay, and we have a hope that's going to last forever. It's never going to go away, and we're going to find true fulfillment which is something that Jesus came on this earth to give. He didn't. He came to save us from our sin, and that's great. But you know what? He also came, us, came to give us a full life. 
His desire is that we would have a great life. Not just okay. He wants it to be great. And, and to have a great life, we have to trust in what he's saying. If we, if we listen to what he's saying and we don't give it any regard, just, we're not going to benefit by it. Just like if you're, you know, a math major or you're a music major and you're, and your professor says, this is how it's right. This is the right way to do this. If you don't do it, it's not going to be right. It just won't. And and we learn to trust our professors and our teachers because we assume that they know what they're doing. Right? Well, this is the ultimate teacher. This is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. So we're always wanting to do what we think is best. But we have to remember that what we think is not always what God thinks. God is better than us, and he's smarter than us. So we need to take one day at a time and keep our focus on loving and trusting in him and continuing to learn who he is, learn how he, what he tells us about life and the way he created us to live, and then putting it into practice. And when we do that, all these other things that we now worry about will be given to us as well, and our worry went down a lot. I won't tell you it will go away for all together, because we're still human. And even when we're trying to have faith, a lot of times we still worry, because we're just sinful people. But the more we focus on doing it right, the less we're going to worry. And the more we're going to have that full life that he's holding on for us. Amen. That's it. Bye, you guys. Hope we see you again sometime. You see me, but I don't see you. Send me a video of you sometime. That'd be cool.